Senator Thun. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, allow me to add my birthday wishes. Happy birthday to you. I'm sorry you're stuck spending it with us. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm not. I'm not at all. Um, Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for today's, uh, thank you for the, uh, holding the hearing and thank today's witnesses for appearing before the committee. According to the World Health Organization, there are more than one billion smokers in the world. Sadly, in one year alone, more than five million of those people will die prematurely due to direct tobacco use. In 1976, Professor Michael Russell, a leading expert on cigarette addiction, wrote, and I quote, people smoke for nicotine, but they die from the tar, end quote. The introduction of e-cigarettes, which usually contain nicotine, but none of the tar involved in ordinary cigarettes, presents new challenges for policymakers, for regulators, and for the public health community. It's also a new opportunity for increased public health to the extent that these new products may help reduce the number of individuals who smoke combustible tobacco cigarettes. Dr. David Abrams and the American Legacy Foundation, at the American Legacy Foundation, a nonprofit organization dedicated to reducing tobacco use that is funded by payments from the master settlement agreement between state attorneys general and the tobacco industry in 1998, has called the e-cigarette a potentially, and I quote, disruptive technology able to render the combustion of tobacco obsolete, end quote. Similarly, Mitch Zeller, director of the Food and Drug Administration Center for Tobacco Products, recently said, and I quote, we have to have an open mind on the potential for these emerging technologies to benefit public health, end quote. In addition, a recent study by researchers at the University College London on the efforts of people to stop smoking found that e-cigarettes are 60% more effective than nicotine replacement therapies such as nicotine patches or gum. Many e-cigarette companies argue that their product is still an emerging technology and warn that restrictions on e-cigarettes that do not follow the science may inhibit future innovation to create safer products for existing smokers. At the same time, we need to be mindful that even if e-cigarettes are shown to be less harmful than combustible tobacco cigarettes, nicotine is addictive, and the long-term usage and health effects of these products are currently unknown. Opponents of the products also believe that e-cigarettes are a gateway to combustible tobacco cigarettes, especially among minors. Recent studies have shown that with an increase in e-cigarette marketing, overall awareness of e-cigarettes is growing, and some advertisements, whether they're intended to or not, are reaching youth audiences. In addition, the campaign for tobacco-free kids, represented here today by Mr. Myers, has identified e-cigarette advertisements that employ similar campaigns and themes as advertisements from combustible cigarette companies decades ago. While this is not necessarily the case for all e-cigarette companies, it raises understandable concerns about the targeting of this advertising. There's also been a recent rise in the number of calls to poison centers involving children related to e-cigarettes and the accompanying solution, which often contains nicotine and other ingredients. The American Academy of Pediatrics, represented here today by Dr. Tansky, has raised concerns about the lack of child-resistant packaging on these products. Earlier this year, the Food and Drug Administration proposed a deeming rule to regulate e-cigarettes as tobacco products. A number of questions are being asked about just how these products should be regulated, especially how they can and cannot be marketed. Given that these are relatively new products and given the extent to which they may provide benefits to public health, I believe sound science should drive any discussion of federal regulation. I also think we should all agree that children should not be able to purchase these products. My home state of South Dakota has banned the sale or use of e-cigarettes by those younger than 18 years of age, and several other states have done the same. While I'm opposed to smoking in general, I look forward to learning more about the apparent potential of e-cigarettes to reduce harm to current smokers. As with most issues that we face in Congress, I believe that more scientific investigation and thoughtful discussion is needed. And Mr. Ballin is here to discuss some of his work with the University of Virginia to start a dialogue between various stakeholders on these issues. I'd like to end with a quote from Dr. Thomas Glenn, who's a director at the American Cancer Society, who sums up the current debate surrounding e-cigarettes as, as follows, and I quote, as with so many highly celebrated or reviled products, their true nature likely lies somewhere in between with both pros and cons to recommend or discourage their use, end quote. Hopefully we can shed some light on these pros and cons here today. So uh, thank you again to our witnesses for appearing today, and I look forward to hearing your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Myers, uh, assuming we all agree that children should not be able to purchase these products, what's your view on whether e-cigarettes have the potential to reduce harm if current adult smokers of combustible tobacco cigarettes switch to them? Um, as I said, if properly regulated in terms of quantity of nicotine, how it's delivered, the manner of, and it's delivered, and it's targeted to a current smoker who couldn't otherwise quit with levels of nicotine sufficiently so that they switched exclusively to e-cigarettes, I don't think there's any doubt that there would be a reduction in harm. What's, the, uh, what's your sort of general view with regard to the science around e-cigarettes? Do you view it as settled? No, the science is, is not settled, and the science couldn't be settled because the product itself is changing. Unfortunately, we haven't had the kind of rigorous science for this that we'd require for any other product under the regulation of the FDA. Um, our organization, and I think all of the other public health groups, would welcome rigorous science so that if e-cigarettes have the potential to help millions of smokers quit, we do the kind of science so that we're sure that the product that we're selling to them will actually accomplish that goal. In the absence of regulation, what we've seen is products with nicotine levels of enormously different levels, high enough to be of concern, and in some kind cases so low that the fear is it, it just makes it too easy for kids to start because nicotine is harsh. And the last thing we want to do is have a perfect product for a kid to start as well as advertising. So it is science that should drive it, but precautionary principle of protecting our kids and how we go about developing that science. Thank you. Mr. Ballin, uh, there's been a lot of discussion about the benefits and harm of e-cigarettes, as you know. In your testimony, you agree with Mitch Zeller, the director of FDA Center for Tobacco Products, who's recently said there's a continuum of risks for nicotine-containing products. Uh, you also stated that any regulation of those products should be based on the relative risks and intended uses. Can you elaborate on how we can find the um, appropriate balance for e-cigarettes and what uh, some of the key players um, can do to further that dialogue and scientific research? Yeah, I think that, you know, what I'm hearing around this table is, a, is actually a common direction of what needs to be done. There needs to be more research. There's no question about it. It needs to be done by uh, FDA internally, NIH, and other places, coupled with uh, universities and other academics. Also, industry has a responsibility. I think that, the, that was, there was a statement made by someone earlier that there has to be accountability of this industry. And I think that as the agency begins to regulate these products and anybody wants to file an application, with the agency, they're going to have to have the proof to back up uh, whatever they're asking for the agency to approve a product or also allow a claim or anything else. We need to head that in that direction very quickly. I agree with a lot of what's been said at this table. The other thing is I think we need an aggressive monitoring surveillance system. We've talked about that many, many years over the years when, you know, uh, in the public health community and at FDA. And I think that in order to find out what's going on in the marketplace, we need to be able to tap into uh, the industry documents. If it's not uh, proprietary information. FDA needs to do a better job of coordinating efforts to see what's happening out there so we can take the ne necessary steps to take action. There is a lot of things that need to be done. There's no question about it. But I think that collectively and responsibly, if it's done properly, we are going to be able to deal with some of the issues that were talked about today. Uh, throwing grenades at each other and uh, I don't think is going to be productive. And that's why over the years I've come to the conclusion that when people actually can sit down in a room without negotiating anything and have a, a civil conversation, off the wall, you know, off, uh, off the record conversation, progress can be made. It may not be, but until you start talking, um, you're never going to find out. And I will say that, again, for me, this hearing is beginning that process up here, and I appreciate it. Let me ask you, what concerns do you have about advertising to children, and, um, and how has the emergence of the tobacco companies in the e-cigarette field uh, changed the market or the perceptions of the advertising? Well, uh, for me, being from the public health community, I have the same concerns that many in public health have about uh, the uh, advertising go crossing the line. Now, I don't know where that is necessarily, um, but I will say that some of the things I've, I've seen um, bother me uh, as a public health person, but I don't think banning advertising per se is the, is the route to, to, to go because at the same time, I think we need to be providing truthful, accurate information 
to the 40 million smokers out there about what these products are and how they can be used. That is, a, I think, where we need to go. So I, I agree that we, we need to monitor, monitor this stuff, which is what I just said earlier. Um, there are things that give me heartburn uh, about what I see in the marketplace, uh, and I think we need to deal with them up front in a very, and in a very honest manner. Uh, just very quickly, Mr. Healy, Mr. Weiss, what, what, uh, what are your companies doing to restrict advertising to children? Uh, as I mentioned briefly, we adopted a, uh, at Blue a policy that we uh, got from the Tobacco Control Act, and that was that in our print and television and, and marketing efforts, that the audience be at least 85% uh, adult. Uh, as I said, which is was what we uh, decided to impose and, and got that from the Tobacco Control Act. Uh, and in Android's case, we also self-regulate. So in the, in the years that's led up to this regulation, we only advertise uh, in programming that would have a predominant uh, adult audience, whether that be on television or in print. Uh, Mr. Chairman, my time's expired. Thanks. Thank you.